We made it! I can't believe we made it! Son, we only crossed the street. What, uh, what happened to your voice? And since when do you smoke? What do you mean? I've been smoking my whole life. <laughs> Well, that checks out. How you holding up, Dylan? I'm alive, but they got me pretty good. Be, be honest, how's it looking? My God. Look, we gotta get Dylan some medical attention ASAP. We need to find a way off this roof. But, uh, you know guys, this whole apocalypse thing going on well, kind of reminds me a lot of Left 4 Dead. He seriously isn't doing this right now, is he? <laughs> When it comes to exciting zombie shooters, in my opinion, this one stands highly above the rest. Between the years 2009 and 2013, then hell, even now. If you ask me to play this game, I'm down. Doesn't matter what's going on, I'm dropping everything to play it. Now, some may say that they can't get into it because it's simply going from point A to point B while killing zombies along the way. Well, I mean, they'd be right. But there's a lot more to it than that. Between each line of dialogue, atmosphere that erodes off each map, and behind each safe room door, is lore and story that's been embedded to each set piece, giving these empty streets and abandoned buildings a rich tale to behold. Dude, they've got Dylan! So let's talk about the game that is Left 4 Dead. Somewhere in the year 2009, the East Coast is soon to be introduced to a pathogen from one patient zero that will be the catalyst spawning an epidemic of disastrous proportions. This will be known as the Green Flu. In the mid-Atlantic state of Pennsylvania, believed to be in the city of Fairfield, the Commonwealth and local police begin receiving reports of mysterious disappearances, starting from pets and eventually missing persons. Within the next few days, the Civil Emergency and Defense Agency, also known as CETA, discover the keynotes of a pathogen, quickly making its rounds within hotspots across the East Coast and begin distributing face masks, quarantining homes, stores, and city blocks, while alerting and informing the general public on how to avoid the spread of infection and on proper ways of setting up safe rooms. As more and more days go by, all attempts of relief and slowing down the virus's spread are ineffective, as CETA's attempts to mask the severity of it all come crashing down. Mask panic sets in, and the general public begin attempting to flee the city, assumingly causing more potential spread and skyrocketing the infection rate. CETA begins the shutdown of the Fairfield Airport, preventing air travel to and from the town, opting in to set up evacuation centers across the city. These efforts are in an attempt to control the spread of the infection, letting the individuals who are not infected out while turning Fairfield into a quarantine zone. Infected individuals begin attacking other evacuees with excessive violence and rabies-like symptoms, with the sole intention of simply causing harm to others. As the attacks happen, the green flu pathogen begins to spread by many means, such as bites, scratches, even airborne in some cases, as the virus appears to be changing and mutating on a daily basis, making it impossible to pinpoint any kind of medical aid. More and more cases begin popping up by the second, as violence, death, and chaos become widespread. In retaliation, the military sends in troops to control the chaos and begin to barricade all bridges, highways, overpasses, and underpasses, not allowing anyone in or out. The militaristic efforts are useless, as more and more reports from both South Atlantic areas within Georgia and Louisiana come in, as well as reports of extreme mutations within infected individuals. Unable to control the rapid and aggressive spread of the virus, as well as the widespread violence making groups unable to fulfill relief efforts, these events are officially dictated an epidemic. Pennsylvania has been lost. Bill is an old, rugged man who served in the U.S. Army 1st Special Forces Group during his two tours in Vietnam. While deployed, Bill suffers a knee injury resulting in his discharge from the Special Forces due to his ailments being too severe. His military days are over, and he's sent back home to live out the rest of his life. 
Within a Philadelphia Veterans Hospital two days after the first infection, Bill is seen sitting at the foot of a bed speaking to a resident who's in the process of learning to become a doctor, speaking with Bill about his upcoming operation. After attempting to make awkward small talk, Bill is sent to the operating room where we see his point of view laying on an operating table receiving his anesthesia. As Bill begins going under, he's asked to begin counting down. On the cusp of falling completely under the effects of the drugs, his eyes shoot open as he begins to see his doctor being torn apart by the nurse. Witnessing the brutality and disbelief of what he's seeing, the doctor is sent crashing into the operating table, causing Bill to fall to the floor. Almost blacking out, Bill, terrified, begins making his way through the hospital in pure disbelief, unable to tell what's real and what's not. After stumbling through the halls, Bill goes crashing into a medical staff's room in search of supplies. Bill grabs whatever he can that's sharp enough to fight back. Equipped with what little he found, Bill takes to the streets, fighting off the infected with only a bone saw and a scalpel. After an uncertain amount of time and brutality, dazed and bruised, Bill stumbles back home, finally, finally able to gain some composure. He flips on his lights, experiencing what may be the last moment of quiet and peace he'll get. He begins heading to a lockbox on the floor. Opening it, he puts on his old Vietnam uniform. Taking one good look at a photo of his old platoon, he puts on his beret and heads out to bring the fight to the infected. His war's not yet over. Lewis is a young man who had a stable job as a junior system analyst working for a company called Franklin Brothers IT department. However, two days after the first infection, Lewis proceeds with his normal day-to-day -day grind and goes into work despite what he's heard about a flu making its rounds, noting that hardly anyone's come in that day. Staring through the empty halls of his workplace, Lewis decides upon giving his friend Ray a call. He tries convincing him to come into work. However, Ray, fearing for his own safety and health, opts in to stay home, stating it looks like the end of the world out there. Afterwards, a frustrated Lewis goes to use the restroom, greeting one of the few co-workers there along the way. Sitting down for just a few seconds, there's a knock on Lewis's stall. Then another. Then another. The knocks grow louder, up to an aggressive pace. And all of a sudden, the knocking stops. A spray of blood shoots underneath the stall door. Terrified, Lewis is left with no other option but to see who or what caused this bloody mess. Slowly, carefully, he looks over the stall to see nothing. Turning back around to the inside of his stall, he sees the man from earlier who begins attacking him. In a panic, Lewis is desperately kicking and punching the man, but he can't seem to get away. In a desperate effort, Lewis grabs a toilet paper dispenser he kicked off the wall and begins beating the man over and over and over and over. Finally, he stopped. The man stopped attacking, stopped moving. Left with a mess of blood and water, Lewis leaves the bathroom slowly walking back to his desk. He sees the floor he works on in shambles, destroyed, covered in blood. It looked like a war zone. Taking a look out the window on his floor, he sees a Philadelphia, now in ruin. At his feet, he sees the body of one of his coworkers, dead with a bite mark on his arm. Looking at his own, he sees a bite mark from his conflict earlier. Assuming the worst, Lewis sits down staring out the window unsure of what's to come. He's loud, he's brash, and he hates everything. A member of the Hell's Legion Motorcycle Club, Francis is no stranger to trouble. Whether that trouble's of legal or illegal in circumstance, it didn't really matter to him. Two days after the first infection, in an attempt to hide under the shroud of all the chaos, Francis attempts to steal a flat screen TV, only to be caught immediately. Failing to talk his way out of it, he ends up being given a prison sentence, as Francis regales this story to his friends at a bar. Knowing it'll be a while before they see each other again, Francis and a girl named Sandra head to the roof for some one-on-one -on -one time. In an attempt to make quick use of the time they have, the two begin kissing each other. However, in the middle of kissing, Sandra gets sick and vomits all over Francis' vest and the roof. Francis, not willing to risk the quality state of his vest, goes to leave. But Sandra, grabbing for him, asks for one more embrace and hugs Francis. 
In the middle of the hug, Sandra bites a chunk right out of Francis's neck. Unsure of what's going on, Francis sprints back into the bar. Chasing him down the stairs, Francis runs back to the crowd of his friends, as Sandra leaps across the room towards Francis, only to get shot out of the air by his friend Duke. Duke, after reveling in his great shot, goes on to explain that Sandra was a zombie, and they're all in the midst of an apocalypse. An excited Francis finally sees this as the exact thing he's wanted to do. Be able to do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. Having his friends grab a jukebox and Francis grabbing a crap ton of guns and beer, they all head to the roof and begin laying into the horde outside. It's her first semester at college. Now an adult and needing a place to stay, Zoe makes the decision to move in with her father after living with her mother for quite some time following her parents' divorce. At the end of her first semester and two days after the first infection, Zoe's having a dinner with her parents at her father's apartment. The two are arguing over Zoe's decision to drop out of college after only one semester. Her mother argues how expensive it is, stating that they sent her to school in order to learn how to make films, not sit in her father's apartment watching them all day. Her father says she has plenty of options still. She could even join the police force, just like her old man. All that Zoe sits, having to listen to them both speak like she isn't even there. In the middle of the argument, a man emerges in the doorway to the kitchen. Zoe and her mother brace each other in the corner as her father rushes to his coat and grabs his standard-issued pistol and starts counting down, demanding the man leave his home. One. Two. Right at the two count, the infected lunges at her mother, biting a chunk of her face off. Zoe watches in terror as her father plants one into the infected's head. Cradling her mother, Zoe's father yells for her to call 911. She rushes to the phone. However, due to the ensuing chaos of the outbreak, all lines are busy. Within the time it took Zoe to run to the phone and call 911, her mother turns and begins brutally biting and clawing at her dad. Zoe, terrified with the brutality before her, pleads with her mother to stop, all for her mom to slowly turn around and direct the brutality at Zoe. Lunging across the room, Zoe, frozen in fear, can only watch as her mother closes the distance. At the last second, Zoe is only saved by her own father, shooting what used to be her mother. A brief moment of silence fills the air, as Zoe runs, trying to comfort her injured father. Her dad laying there reminisces about the movies they used to watch together, asking her if she remembers those parts in the old horror movies they watched where they have to shoot the guy before he turns. Zoe states that they always used to laugh at those parts together, as her father tells her, I love you, Zoe. Zoe responds, I love you too, Dad. Our four survivors have finally united and are in the streets of Fairfield, quietly making their way through the streets in an attempt to reach the roof of a nearby apartment building. This proved more challenging than anticipated as the survivors accidentally set off a car alarm, drawing in a massive horde of infected to their location. With the infected quickly surrounding them, they were left with only one decision left, and that was to make a run for it. Nearly escaping the hordes of infected, the group make refuge on the rooftop of an apartment building. Nearly escaping the hordes of infected, the group finally get to the rooftop of the apartment building they were fighting so hard to get to. Now they need a new plan. As the group sits on the rooftop, a helicopter flies over, alerting anyone who's still alive that evacuation efforts have moved to Mercy Hospital. With the hospital as the new goal, the survivors begin the journey. Escaping the apartment, the group heads to a nearby subway that takes them underground through a series of abandoned trains and dilapidated subway tunnels. After fighting off ambushes from hordes and special infected, the group reach a subway station that takes them back to street level. After fighting off the swarming hordes and special infected, the group exit the subway but find themselves in the sewers beneath the city. The dimly lit and claustrophobic sewer tunnels set the scene as the survivors face infected emerging from the dark sewer tunnels and rising out of the water itself. Eventually they find a ladder that finally leads to the surface. It's a mad dash for the hospital towering over them as the streets outside Mercy Hospital are overrun. The survivors make it to the safe room right at the hospital's entrance, only to find it eerily quiet and abandoned. As they finally make it inside the hospital, they see signs of chaos all over. Overturned furniture, bloodstains, and abandoned medical equipment. The survivors head through each floor, one step at a time, one infected at a time. 
However, it's not as simple as taking the stairs, as most floors are either filled to the brim with infected, or elevators and stairwells have collapsed on themselves, forcing the survivors to find other means of getting to the roof. The survivors eventually navigate to the hospital's rooftop where they find a radio transmitter that they must activate to signal for rescue. As they activate the radio signal, an onslaught of infected are drawn to the noise. It feels as though the whole city is flooding in to kill these four individual survivors. Against all odds, they have to hold out against the waves of infected. It's their only means of escape. After what feels like an eternity, and hundreds of thousands of bullets later, the chopper arrives and the four survivors finally escape this hell. Or so they thought. Or so they thought. The brief moment of victory and safety is cut short as the helicopter pilot who had rescued the survivors from the Mercy Hospital rooftop begins to turn mid-flight. Succumbing to the infection, the survivors are left with no choice but to shoot the pilot and brace for impact as the chopper comes crashing down. After safely escaping the crash and its debris, the group finds themselves just outside the city of Fairfield and in a place called Whitney County. With the sound of the crash surely drawing in nearby infected, the four begin their trek through an industrial work district. This takes them through many abandoned factories and workstations and abandoned warehouses. Traveling all the way across the district, they arrive at a truck depot where the group recalls that in a nearby town of Riverside, they'd heard word of another evacuation site that might still be taking survivors. With not many other options, they now just needed a way to get there. Banking it all in an armored truck within the depot, the group lowers the truck off a lift, drawing in a horde in the process. However, it looks like they may be in luck as the truck is up and running, and so are the survivors as they begin making their trip to Riverside. Thankfully, the truck took them where they were going, the town of Riverside. The bad news was that due to some fallen trees and a collapsed bridge, it wasn't taking them any further. It looks like the rest is on foot. Surrounded by the woods, abandoned cars, and many places for infected to hide, it feels as though they're just as vulnerable as they were in the city. Crossing the destroyed bridge by crawling down and up what's left of its cement and rebar pieces, the group reaches a highway tunnel. Dimly lit and crawling with infected, if there was any chance of rescue, they had to make it through. Finding their way through a maze of broken open walls and run-down cars, the group makes it out of the other end, winding up inside the entrance of a sewer system once again. This one much more open and grand in scale. Of course, this only makes it harder to navigate as the whole system is damaged. With collapsed sewer pipes, broken machines, and collapsed scaffolding, it was never going to be easy. After raising a bridge that thankfully led the group back to the surface, they end up in an abandoned train yard. Another step closer to what they hope will be a rescue. Climbing out of the train cars, the stations, and everywhere in between, it's a fight leading forward as infected continue to sprout from everywhere. Heading up the street and needing to pass through a gravesite is a church. And what would normally mean salvation for most means the opposite for our survivors, as a man who is in a manic state begins ringing the church bell when the group asks for entry. This draws in every infected within the surrounding area. After fighting off the infected, the group approached the door once more, only to find out the man inside had turned, and they proceed to put him out of his misery. From the church, taking an exit through the roof, this leads the group right into Riverside, However, with this requires them having to navigate the infested town. While not being as large as Fairfield, it doesn't mean it's any less dangerous. Through dilapidated shops, convenience stores, and residential homes, the group successfully make it to the Riverside Park. They're in the home stretch. Underneath and through pavilions and small park stations, the group makes it to a small boatside house and dock, where an announcement over a radio can be heard as a couple by the name of John and Amanda Slater are broadcasting a radio message stating that they're anchored right offshore and aiding in evacuation efforts. Once prepared to hold out, the group signals John and Amanda to come get them, alerting a horde. Holding out within the Riverside home, the group defiantly hold out with an ETA of 10 minutes until the boat's arrival. These 10 minutes feel like an eternity, wave after wave, infected after infected, and tank after tank. The boat finally arrives. It's a mad dash for their escape as storms of infected follow behind. Right in the nick of time, the group boards the ship, and they've made it to another moment's reprieve. After the events in Riverside, the survivors make safe voyage to Newburgh, where they take shelter in the back room of a rooftop greenhouse. Overhead, a low-flying plane blasts past the survivors, striking discussion that an airport could be making evacuation flights. Moving from the greenhouse, the survivors' first view is of a fiery hellscape that the city has become. They make their way down and out and through a dilapidated apartment building, all the while being visually struck with the sight of SOSs reading help, starving, 
empty food containers, and destroyed rooms. Upon reaching the street level, the survivors hop off the bus, crash into a complex, and run to the other side of the street, hoping for a passage within the Harborview Hotel. Passage is exactly what they would find. Through the lobby is a safe room holed up in the hotel's kitchen. Then their exit. Outside of the kitchen, the survivors head through a storage room and back to the streets. The only way around is to vault over a fence and into the slums. On the other side, there is no way back. The survivors climb up a fire escape and make their way back onto the roof of the hotel. The only way across is to lower a rooftop crane holding a crate to create a makeshift bridge from roof to roof. The sound of the crane draws in undead for miles and the survivors hold them off until it's safe to make a move. From then on, it's an objective to find a pathway out. Through the Merrill Law Office and across the street, they're drawn to the ever-familiar safe room graffiti on the front of the self-storage building and they make leeway to safety. For now, of course. Inside, they're surrounded by crates and boxes long abandoned by their owners. Ahead, they fight through alleys and directly into a towering construction site that was never completed. Again, the survivors are left with no choice but to make their own exit, exploding a boarded off alley with some fuel tanks. A swift exit from the site and into a substation has them crawling through a web of electric lines and transformers. The survivors fight, finding themselves at Metro International Airport. Segmented airliners, cars piled in the road, and the street absolutely decimated. They rush around the wreckage, through the parking garage, and up to level B where signs point for the air bridge. Once they were secure in the safe room on the other side of the bridge, ahead lies the entire airport. One more push should be all it takes. Entering the Metro International Airport and navigating the top floors, they rush past the reception lounge, workstations, conference rooms, and offices. All of this leads them to the lobby, illuminated with flight boards displaying the different flights which have all been delayed. With ticketing and check-in blocked off, they turn to a vehicle, careening it right through the gate that's blocking the way. It does feel like a mad dash to catch a flight as infected chase after the survivors. Where people would once enter the gate to catch their flight, now the survivors sprint past piles of clothes, bodies, and fallen debris. Up a flight of stairs, they get a view of the runway decorated by destruction. Their whole journey behind them all culminates to this moment, and they hurriedly fight to make it to their gate. At last, they make it to their exit, Gate B2, with hope in their hearts that the plane they saw has landed on the runway. At last, they make it to their exit, Gate B2, with hope in their hearts that the plane they saw has landed on the runway. Down the flight ramp, they watch as a plane comes around and down towards the runway. This could be it until it comes quickly careening into the pavement, leaving an explosion in its place. It seemed all hope would be lost until the survivors find a plane, captain, and ready to leave the runway. The only catch would be the survivors radio the captain and discover they must fuel the plane before takeoff. What ensues is a battle among the wreckage. After waves of infected watch in for the survivors, the end of their struggle is in sight. The plane's carriage door opens and they make their leave. Safe once again, with hopes that this flight will go better than the last. The survivors have landed. The infected woods of the Allegheny National Forest lie around them. To their right, an evacuation notice hangs for the National Forest sign. Daughtry Farm, 115 North Hill Road, Cedar Evac Center. They head north and begin their journey to their next and hopefully last evacuation center. The sounds of undead echo through the gray dead woods as the survivors follow the trail ahead of them. An old job site trailer lies dormant and to the left of that, an old freight building. Warding off waves of infected crawling from the woodwork, the survivors make their way downhill and into their first safe room at Richardson Atlantic Freight Haulage. Whilst the survivors regain their composure, the graffiti sprawled on the wall reassures them that they're on the right path. Follow the tracks. With that mantra in mind, the survivors fight their way out of the safe room, down the hall, down a flight of stairs, and through a destroyed office. Around them throughout are monitors crashed to the floor. Garbage, scrap paper, blood painted on the walls, and soaked into the floor. Quickly, they shoot and batter the way across the warehouse, looking for a way through. Stumbling upon and activating a security door, alarms begin to blare as the building comes alive. They make their leave, sprinting past motor rooms and service tanks. Finally exiting to the outside, they see their first look at tracks. Cargo cars sit rusting, and the survivors work their way down a foggy alley, snaking through a sea of undead and train cars. Hopping over a crashed gas tanker, they peek through a demolished wall and are greeted with the sight of their next safe room. The group gathers what they can from the long dormant locker room and continue on their way. The sound of hissing gas running through pipes in the tunnel outside their door. Following the narrow corridor, the group finds an opening staring back out into a valley. Infected rush them and crawl down into the valley as they fight their way to an entrance leaving back into the main tunnel that was blocked off. 
back on the right track, they follow the line to a train yard, where the only way up and around is to disconnect the latch on a train car and watch as it comes speeding off into the bridge. The sound of the wreck pulls the infected out from the woods and the survivors rush across the nearly dropped bridge, running ahead and barricading themselves into the next safe room. Relief watches over the group. The final stretch is ahead of them. The group pulls up their bootstraps, reloads their guns, and ventures back out into the battle. An old barn looms ahead of them. Inside, webs drape above their heads, saddles hang from the rafters, and an old car sits next to some hay bales. Moving onward across the hills of Allegheny, through a warehouse, and down the tracks to an old train station. Once inside and looking out the third floor window, they see a bridge with a building atop across the tracks. They exit out of a window, hopping off an awning and back onto the tracks. Running for the end of the line, they move out into the fog and across the bridge where they thankfully find shelter in a train car. The survivors heed the words of the civilians behind them, following the tracks right down to the end. Around them, cars, tankers, and trains are wrecked into the ground. Climbing atop a flipped train car, the survivors use it as a bridge, moving above to another pathway with a sign reading, with a sign reading, CAUTION. You are now entering a U.S. military evacuation outpost. Use of deadly force has been authorized. Following the fenced-in cornfield around them, fog fills in the field, and the crows wander around them. Any call would assuredly draw in the infected. Moving swiftly through the grave environment around them, they pass across the farm, through an old barn and into the site of their new CETA evac center. In front of the survivors was Daughtry Farm. Inside the farmhouse, a radio had been left for anybody who still remained. Upon answering the military's emergency broadcast, the man on the other end is shocked to hear that anyone even made it. With their evacuation confirmed and the military on their way, the survivors were left to fend off the farm until extracted. From then on, the several floors of the farmhouse become overwhelmed with infected. With the bodies piling up and ammo running thin, the survivors hear the traction of tires burning through the yard. A military vehicle arrives and opens its hatch to retrieve the group. They're safe once again. Off to the next day and the rest of their afflicted lives. And that's pretty much what I can tell you about the first Left 4 Dead game. Cool. I'm glad we had like 30 minutes for you to talk about it. But what about the sacrifice and the second game? Come on, man. It's already been like 27 minutes. I, I don't think we got time for that. We're about to break through the roof! We really should have tried finding a way off this roof. Well, guys, this is it. If we don't make it, I... I just want you to know it's been... All right living in that house with you guys. Oh, fuck you. We're great roommates. Is it Sita? No. It's... It's Big Bear! <laughs> guys, go, 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 go! <laughs> Big Man, you made it! B -b but where have you been? Well, gentlemen, if the ending of Zombie... If the ending of Zombie Media has taught me anything, it's that flight where we are right now is the safest way to travel. Let's go home. This is what we take away from all this? Nothing else? Just helicopters are safe? Huh? Are they even that safe? Hmm... There was a severed arm just laying on the floor. I mean, whose arm is that? I mean, accidents happen. It was also easy enough for Big Man to commandeer it. Did he do this? Well, well now you're just being silly.